there's all these people who are like, I've got a big jet. You want to be rich? Like dollar dollar bills, y'all. Like I get bling from my wife because that's what she deserves and all women want money. That's what, blah, blah, blah. like join my course. I'm like, I wanted to barf all over myself. Podcast Junkies, episode 187. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. If you're new to the show, then welcome. The red carpet has been rolled out for you. This is the show where we talk to interesting podcasters that have come across my path, that have been introduced to me, and that uh, somehow find their way through a cold outreach, like a couple of uh, folks did uh, several episodes ago. But this is just a fascinating way for me to have a nice one-to-one conversation and to let you, the listener, understand a little bit more and discover a little bit more what it is that makes this podosphere so special. So in case you missed last week's episode, we had a great, great conversation, went a little longer than normal with Justin Jackson, host of Build Your SaaS and Product People. And they're also, uh, he's also one of the co-founders of Transistor.fm, a new podcasting hosting service that's come on the scene. So great episode. We just, as you can tell, we were geeking out on all things tech and uh, that explains the, the nearly 90 minute episode. This week, I have the pleasure of speaking with Laura Peterson. And uh, she's the host of Copy That Pops. We connected or reconnected in uh, Australia during the We Are podcast conference. And it was a nice time to catch up. We had seen each other in passing before at other conferences, but never had a chance to to really uh, talk. And and this was a great way uh, and some great time together that we spent with uh, a bunch of other cool folks who have mentioned earlier. In this episode, um, we talk about... um, (laughs) <laughs> playing a couple of games down there uh, that allowed us to break the ice with our fellow podcasters, um, what her entrepreneurial background was and how she shifted her focus from podcasting to writing books, um, how she's grown in, as an interviewer, and her earliest recollection of her passion for writing, which is really, really interesting. We talk about the power of words and why Laura has been avoiding consuming different content. So... Um, as usual, she shares uh, books and podcasts that have been instrumental, which is extremely helpful. So remember, full show notes are going to be at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 187. As many of you know, I take pride in trying to have the best quality audio available, even though I could be traveling sometimes. So I've been known to experiment with a bunch of different mics, depending on where I am. I always try to make it a point to pack my Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 and their sponsors of the show this week. Focusrite has been generous enough to sponsor Podcast Junkies and I can't say enough of good things about the company. And to be honest, I've had this Focusrite 2i2, the Scarlet, otherwise known as the Little Red Box, for several years now. Why I love it is because it's got this front interface that allows you to plug in the two mics as XLR mics. And even if you've got a mic like the Shure SM7B that I was using previously, that's a little power hungry, you can use it with the Phantom Power. Uh, It works wonderfully with that. And I love the controls on the mic. I get to monitor my own audio by plugging my headphones straight into the headphone jack on the front of this, the Scarlet. And overall, it's just just adds that extra level of boost and richness to my sound. Extremely reliable, extremely sturdy, and it's one of my go-to recommendations when I'm working with clients and I'm having them do a brand new setup. If you haven't heard of it or haven't seen the specs, then head on over to podcastjunkies.com forward slash 2i2, and it'll be taken straight to the Amazon page, and you can check the specs there. So nothing but good things to say about Focusrite. Happy to have them as sponsors of the show. Make sure you stay to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. But for now, enjoy my conversation with Laura. So Laura Peterson, host of Copy That Pops. Thank you so much for being a guest on Podcast Junkies. So great to be here. Good to see you again, (laughs) Harry. I mean, talk to you. (laughs) Yeah, well, see you because we're using Squad. Shout out to Squadcast, um, which is now what I'm using for all my interviews um, because we can see each other face to face and... I don't know what experience you've had with interviews before, but I, there's something about the face to face that mm-hmm. gives you like the, the emotion, the body language, and just the eye contact. Is just it just makes for a completely different interview. I don't know if you've found that to be the case as well. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think that there are some pros and cons to both directions. So mm-hmm. for me, when I first started the show, I only did audio and. I loved that because I was kind of nervous. And so I was like, okay, one less thing 
that I have to be paying attention to so I could, you know, be in my pajamas, my hair could be a mess. And yeah. I could keep on looking back to my notes because when I was, you know, a new host, I was so nervous and I would look at my notes and kind of look at what's the next question and, and all that. And then as being interviewed, I also was extra nervous if there was going to be a video element. So I liked it as a guest for a while. Now I've done so many, I don't care. It's like, whatever, you know, <laughs> we can roll with it. But, uh, you know, one of my early mentors in the podcasting world made the case that an audio only podcast is better for the listeners because if the listener can't see our nonverbal cues, then they're mm -hmm. missing something from the conversation. So you could mm -hmm. argue it almost on the other direction. I thought that was really interesting because, you know, we might kind of nod or something and, and maybe someone's missing. But yeah. I think either way, whatever you're comfortable with, go with it because when you're being most comfortable and the guest being most comfortable, I think is going to end up making it the best result. Yeah, I'm always conscious of that. Like when a, a guest mentions a term that's like an acronym or something like that, or or a topic that's really like random, I'm like, well, uh, for the benefit of the listener, like, can you just explain what that is or what you just said? <laughs> and as, as long as we as podcast hosts don't forget that it's you and I speaking, but there's, you know, folks specifically listening to this conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I always call out, call out my friend, Patrick, one of my super fans who, who <laughs> listens to each and every episode. Uh, I put a retention hashtag at the end of each episode. It's like this little uh, hashtag that you have to post on Twitter uh -huh. and I only have it at the end of the episode. So for each episode, I just come up like for this one, I'll be like, um, you know, Laura pops or something like that, <laughs> you know, just something fun, but it's only something that you'll hear at the end, literally at the very, very, very end. And so I, 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 and then I see they tag me and they tag you. And so if you, when you see that in Twitter, you'll know that those are the super fans. Oh, they, I love that. <laughs> I, one time I left it out um, and they're like, where's, where's the retention hashtag? <laughs> That's an awesome hack. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I learned it from a friend of mine, um, um, Jesse Lawler of the uh, Smart Drug Smarts podcast. He was oh. on like a couple of years ago. And he had he called it the ruthless retention gimmick. And he was he would release he would talk about something at the end of the interview. I just learned about this new like um, supplement that's really going to like you know expand your your brain or something like that. So we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this little thing, you know, it's kind of like from TV, right? Like oh, yeah. um, coming soon or, or just sneak peek, you know, and stuff, that sort of thing. I think we have to remember psychologically, like people mm -hmm. want to have something to wait for or to look forward to and they get excited about those little easter eggs absolutely yeah that's what i love to that's right at my alley with what i talk about on my show is it's called copy that pops and sort of the explanation for that is writing that stands out that's compelling that has psychology applied to it so that it's really effective for whatever you're doing with your business online that's kind of the origin of of naming it that way but i love psychology and applying it so let's dive a little bit into the background yeah. um, or just I love to give the origin story of how we met as well. So yeah. we, we had just known each other f through the podcasting circles mm -hmm. and yours again was one of those that like it's been probably years that we've known about each other, and just, <laughs> you know, and then um, of, of all places in Australia, we can. <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember I think that I finally we finally had a conversation like for two seconds at podcast movement in august yeah. of this year 2018 but then just a couple months later in australia we got to hang out for real and it was so yeah. fun <laughs> yeah it's so great and i've talked about the the conference a couple of, of times on the show but it was it was a really interesting opportunity because it was such a small conference probably less than 100 people yeah. and so really intimate i almost got i got to meet almost every attendee mm -hmm. and you know i think even better and just as important i got to spend quality time with some of uh, you know our peers pat flynn was there jordan harbinger dave jackson omar zenhoff uh zenholm um awesome. and hey. travis travis chapel's there mm -hmm. yeah allison Mel melody it was just awesome and uh yeah. i remember at one point i was i remember i was I think I was going to the fridge to get a beer or something like that in the in the retreat we did. And I was like, this is like a little bit of like a podcasting dream come true. Because I remember when I went to New Media Expo, I actually saw Pat Flynn speak and I was like, oh, I want to be a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I know it definitely felt surreal. I was just like, pinch me. Is this really happening? Are we really yeah. playing Never Have I Ever with all these amazing people? <laughs> yeah. I don't know and if again, you that on the show in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anyone knows that game, but uh, how would you describe? How would you describe it? Never have I ever. Um, yeah. Usually, 
usually it's accompanied with adult beverages Mm -hmm. and uh, you basically say things that you've never done, but the goal is to try to get other people to reveal that they have done that thing. So it's usually, it, it starts out a little tame and then it can get a little bit more risque and and funny and interesting. So, (laughs) and, uh, Learn some interesting stuff about uh, our fellow podcasters. Yes, we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> what hap- what, definitely what happens in Australia stays in Australia. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we connected and I'm so grateful because, you know, there's some of those one-to-one, co- even at the conference we spoke, but just the, the retreat, you know, yeah. just getting to chat with you for just, we think always we're going to have these opportunities at these bigger conferences, but I've, I've told people it doesn't yeah. happen, like especially podcast movement and, and even yeah, podcast. It's so big. Like mm-hmm. if you see someone in the hallway, if you get the opportunity to talk to your friend, like talk to them then and there because other stuff is going to happen and the three days going to go by and we're all going to go back home. And and, and, and the, the challenge is as our family gets bigger and bigger, we just have more and more friends in the space. So true. <laughs> In terms of like where you got started, you yeah. you also shared your book at the conference about uh, podcasting yeah. or copywriting for podcasters. Yeah, I gave out copies of both books that I have so far. And by the time someone listens to this in the future, I probably have way more books. I've got a million yeah. more in my head. But yeah, I so my the first company that actually worked for me because I wanted to be an entrepreneur for a while, but I couldn't figure it out. And I was a teacher. I did a master's in education and I taught high school math and psychology. And I loved that, but I just had this burning desire to be an entrepreneur. And so the first thing I tried that actually worked was a tutoring and test prep company, which makes sense because that was my background as academics. And I had a business partner who had some experience doing more businessy stuff too to help complement things. And after a couple of years, my heart just fell out of that space. I don't 100% believe in college being the right path for everyone anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I felt a bit disingenuous really pushing SAT prep and high grades and going to colleges where you take on a bunch of debt just as a recipe for anyone. And a really good friend of mine is the podcast host for a big internet marketing association. And he was like, Hey, I'm really busy. Uh, would, uh, would you be able to do the content marketing on the back end for me? Cause you've been doing really great stuff with your blog and SEO and everything with your tutoring company. And you're like a nerd for writing. I was like, okay. So he would do all the podcast editing, recording and editing, and then I would listen to it before it was live, and I would write up the show notes. I would ghost write a blog article under his name that was inspired by the episode. I would write a bunch of tweets and create social graphics and just kind of do all that stuff to really promote the podcast. And eventually, he was like, what you're doing for me and my editing of the audio is combined is a great business offering. Let's start taking on clients. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. So we started a podcast reduction company, just the two of us, and and brought in a couple of people to help us on the back end too. And that's that is what I was doing when I started my own podcast in April of 2016, which is um, what is that, two and a half years ago as we record this. And so I was trying to grow a podcast production company. But by the end of that year, at the end of 2016, I was just feeling frustrated. Like no one really knows me if I go to conferences. Like I remember I went to Thrive in uh, San Diego in 2016. And I just felt like people were looking past my head. Even though we're having a conversation, they like look past me to go find (laughs) some like quote unquote influencer. Like, oh, there's Pat. Let me go run and take a selfie with him. And they're like ignoring me. And I just felt like I want to be known and respected for what I do. And so Three people all in one week, including James Altucher. I don't know if you've interviewed him yet, but uh, mm-hmm. I asked, I stood up and asked him a question at like a private VIP dinner. And his advice, along with these two other people, all in one week was you should write a book. If you want to stand out, you need to write a book. And I was like, oh, that never really occurred to me to write a book. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. So I decided to do it in 30 days. So I wrote self published and hit number one in podcasts and webcasts on Amazon with my book, Copywriting for Podcasters, all in 30 days. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was two years ago. And after I did that, I had so many people reaching out in 2017 and now obviously also into 2018 because that's what I focus on for clients. They reached out asking for help with books and I got more demand for book help than I ever did for podcast help. So I was like, wait a second, let me make a shift. And so my show copy that pops also happened to be around writing. It wasn't just books, but now on the episodes, I do talk more heavily around books too. And I've just completely 
pivoted with what I was focusing on. And now I exclusively help people to write, self-publish, launch best-selling books on Amazon, and then use their book as a tool to grow their brand and business and their podcasts more too. A lot of my clients have podcasts as well because I'm a big nerd in the in the industry, as are you. And yes, yeah, so that's kind of how I got into what I'm doing now. So do you help with the actual content of like writing everything in the book and the marketing aspect of it? Because usually those are the two, the two aspects of it, right? Like getting the idea out of your head and helping right. writing the book and getting the stuff onto the pages, which is a big challenge for a lot of us. And then mm-hmm. once it's done, people will think like a podcast, okay, I wrote the book, I created yeah. the show. Now everything, everyone's going to magically find it. And so that's right. not the case. <laughs> that's not the case as we know. So do you help with both sides of that? Yeah, I absolutely do. And uh, actually, as we're transitioning into 2019, I'm going to be not taking on one-on-one private clients anymore and just exclusively growing my group programs, which are incredibly successful and people love them and they go through them. But I realized I want to free up more of my own time to do more speaking on stage because I love it now. I used to be terrified of it and now I love it. Even if crazy clicker things happen which <laughs> yeah. at We Are Podcast, I had like the tech issues nonstop and it was just, it was so funny. But I just love organizing and attending events and I love speaking on stage. And so I'm trying to free up more of my own time, just kind of adjust my business model a little bit now that it's two years old and what I've been doing mm-hmm. and and um, not taking on the higher end private clients and focusing more on, on the group programs. It's a bit more affordable and accessible and but yes, absolutely. I can help people with every st- step of the way. And it's more of like um, coaching and consulting in a group way rather than I'm not going to be writing it for you because I'm not taking on private clients you know, for ghostwriting or anything anymore. Yeah. I remember from reading the book when you started the podcast, a, a lot of the folks that you had early on were people that you were working with you know, in like what we're helping you or that you were in like their mastermind and had yeah. encouraged you. So yeah. it, I thought it was really interesting. So can you talk a, a little bit about those early days? Like what what's, what were some of the things you were challenged with or afraid of? Because as podcasters, when, when we first get started, we're like, oh, what am I doing? Like, oh, yeah. Like bottom of the parts. yeah, with my podcast, because I was already essentially had a podcast production company, I had a lot of exposure to the back end. So it was less scary for me than maybe someone who never has experienced it, but it was always, I was helping other people with their show. So it felt like an extra layer removed. And then once it finally had to be me and my voice, I was like, oh my gosh, no one's going to like my voice. Or I say, I'm too much. Cause I'm like totally from the OC. Oh my God. And people are gonna be like, you're crazy <laughs> Valley girl yeah. or something. And I really wanted to delay my launch. So I I kept on saying I was going to launch in April 2016. And I, I, as it was getting closer, there was like, I'm not ready. It's not good enough. I need to redo stuff. And the guy who was on our team who was helping me launch it on the back and he was doing the audio editing, he was like, Laura, you are launching no matter what. That's great. And I was like, Ugh. Okay. Actually, his name is Greg Clunas. Shout out to Greg. Oh, I He's, love Greg. Yeah. Oh, you know Greg. That, I know Greg. Yeah, so yeah. Cool. He, I've been trying to get him. Uh, we've been. It's one of those again. Been years, years. You've known him like yeah. probably four years. I got to get him on the show. Oh, good. I can send a, a little note to. Yeah, because actually he's coming out with a book in January of 2019. So, uh, we actually just cross interviewed each other and. Which is the first, it's so funny because he helped me launch the show and I never had him on the show until, you know, just now. So it's kind of funny how how that happens. But he was just absolutely, Laura, no, you're going. It's like, it's just that idea of done is better than perfect. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful because if I waited till I felt a little more ready, instead of April, it would probably be August or instead of 2016, it would probably be 2017 or 18. But I'm so glad I got the experience under my belt as fast as possible because the only way to get better is to actually do it. And personally, doing my own podcast as the host helped me do better as an interviewee on other podcasts, yeah. right? Because yeah. I was always nervous. and But I would have like a safe zone to practice it myself. And I could do the final editing and cut stuff out if I didn't like it. So I felt like very in control, which I loved that aspect as being the host. So now I'm not nervous to do interviews anymore, which I absolutely was. And it's even now bled into speaking on stage too, because that was like the ultimate scary thing for me was like live in person in front of people. What? So the podcast has helped me so much with all of that. Do you notice yourself or can, can you, I mean, you, you just touched on it, but 
is there specific examples of you realizing that you now are a better interviewer? Because you know, I, I've yeah. noticed it now, and I'm, I'm just a student of the craft now. Like I love listening to interview shows yeah. because uh, there's so many amazing people that do it so well. And so I'm wondering if how you feel you've grown as an interviewer. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, the first two things that come to mind is one, phys- physically how I feel. So mm. in the beginning, you know, I would say, April of 2016 until probably by the end of the summer, because I I did a lot of batching. I was living in Europe at the time, so I did a lot of batch of the interviews. But I would say maybe for the first 20 episodes, easy. And I think Rick Mulready also mentioned that number on your on a past show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think after about 20 interviews, though, I was the host. I went from feeling sick in my stomach, <laughs> so nervous before coming on, because I was like the person I'm having on is going to think I'm an idiot and I'm boring. And you know, I had all these crazy yeah. things around my head. And after about 20, I physically didn't feel nervous anymore. So that was a distinct difference. And then the other thing is just in my preparation. So in my early prep for interviews, I would research for like hours. I would write copious notes. I would write word for word questions that I was going to ask. And some of my early episodes, I didn't even deviate from those questions. So I wasn't, (laughs) I'm sure my early interviews weren't as good as they are now. Oh, well, they're out there for public. I'm not going to take them down. I own it. I love it. It's part of the journey, but I wasn't fully maybe listening to what the guest answered. And I would just go on to my next question anyway. And now I do research, but it's not, it's not so much that it's like, oh my God, I have to anticipate every little thing. It's just like, oh, let me see if I can find a couple of nuggets that we could touch on that'll be really relevant to my audience around books or writing or applying psychology. And so I kind of look for a little key nuggets that I could make sure to ask. And I might write like a little sticky note with just a couple of little words just to remind myself. So just the preparation as a second item is completely different from then and now. Yeah, it's great. It's funny, this, this opportunity that we have to hone a skill Mm-hmm. That you know, three or four years ago, I didn't even think that that's something that would I would be interested in. Right. And and it is a skill, and it's something that um, when you can f- make your guest feel at ease, you it just makes for a better conversation as well. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think it's so true that like, imagine a kid learning to ride a bike, and she's nervous and she falls the first time. If you as the parent are like, wow, you fell on your first try, like. I guess you're just not a bike rider. Give it up. Like that would be insane. That'd be crazy. (laughs) And yet we as adults think that the first time we try anything, we are just automatically going to need to be at the same level as someone been doing it for 10 years. Like it doesn't make any sense. So whoever your quote unquote podcast idols are out there, listen to their first episode. It wasn't like what it is now. So just don't. Pat Pat played his first. I've heard it a couple of times, but he played it in New York podcast and he he cringes. He he still cringes every time. (laughs) I know. And I'm like, wow, like we all have that same human experience. That's just normal. So throughout this ridiculous expectations of perfection, which isn't possible anyway, and it's subjective. So everyone's gonna have a different opinion. What some people might be a hater and don't like about my voice, other people are like, this is what I've been waiting for. So like, exactly. screw the haters, just keep on putting it out there and the right people will find you. What's your earliest recollection of this passion that you have for words? Oh my gosh. That is such, no one has asked me that. So I really wanna think back to a good answer. Okay, the earliest thing that's coming to my mind is, I think it was around third grade. And I remember, I think I I wrote out the word gymnastics because I was like obsessed with gymnastics as a kid. (laughs) And my teacher came by and was like, oh, let me check your spelling. And she was like, gymnastics. Great job, Laura. You got it. This is such a hard word. Amazing job. And I felt so proud of myself. Like, I'm so smart and I know so many words and wow, like (laughs) I think that might be something that was such a positive reinforcement for, for knowing and spelling words correctly. (laughs) Mm. Do you feel like you have the, I it's, I have this weird thing. Mm. It's maybe OCD or something, but I can, I can see a a sentence Mm. 
Yeah. And I love like the grammar of it, but I can also see like if the, the, there's two spaces after a period, it's oh, really yeah. weird. Oh yeah. <laughs> like punctuation, it's just yeah. my eye gets like stuck, sucked into it. I'm the type of person that catches continuity errors in movies, like if the oh, guy's holding too. a cup. Me and too. then the next scene, it's like no cup, or like the, the book was on the shelf, but it's not in there. And then the oh, sex or like scene, the hair is on front of your shoulder or behind. <laughs> Me too. I do it all the time. So it's so funny about having that eye. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like you had it early. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story of, that I that comes to mind for me. Yeah. We used to get 20 words. We have to make a sentence from each word. And this was probably second grade. And I looked at the 20 words and I was like, why don't I write a story with all 20 words? That's and amazing. so <laughs> I would just be sitting there like I would have, and I'd, it would take me like a couple hours, but I'd finally figure every single word. And I was like, is it, I think this is more fun. That's rather than just 20, 20 sentences. Separate. And the, teacher loved it like he, they would look forward to it every time Aww, um so cool. but it's nice and, and it seems like you've always had you know because you do copywriting i think it's such a, mm-hmm. a such a interesting skill and i think more people need to have it i was talking to one of my mm-hmm. clients he's uh he owns a marketing agency uh it's called snyder showdown and he's just talking about his business and the challenges of the entrepreneur's face but he said every single entrepreneur n- needs to learn copywriting yeah, like it's such an important skill, and I think a lot of in the beginning we just have our friends do it, or we find people that can do it for us. But knowing the basics, and you know, as I started getting into this world, you know, the old school copywriters were like, will tell you like, go read the direct yes. mail pieces yes. and then rewrite them by hand on another mm-hmm. pad of paper because that's like mm-hmm. the legit way of like you get into the mindset of like how people yes. speak to people, what language they use, the psychology of getting people to take action. And I just finished up copy for the conference we were talking about, uh, Clarion Conference, and yeah. I was thinking about the same thing. I'm like, what is the emotion I want people to have when they read through this? And and that one was like, you know, I'm, I'm a profoundly spiritual person, so I'm like, I'm always tapped in and, and and I'm looking for signs. And so the copy from that, I remember I was sleeping. I just gotten back from Australia and I was, <laughs> I was staying with a friend and and I, it was like one o'clock in the morning and I'm like, oh, the words were coming down and I just pulled out my journal and I wrote like four pages. And that's, that's what cool. made, that's what made its way into the um into the the page. And so I'm wondering if you know you you sort of feel like you have that same relationship with words. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that because we all love visuals so much and technology allows videos and images to be a lot higher quality than they were in the past, Mm -hmm. that people think that that's the only thing that matters, even with a podcast. I mean, that's why I wrote the book Copywriting for Podcasters is because I think some people go into podcasting because they're like, "Eh, I don't want to write a blog. Like, I don't, I'm not a good writer. Let me just talk. I can talk all day, you know? Um, but really, if you want your show to be found, and then once it's found, if you want your people to actually click and listen, it's the words that they're going to be finding first. So it's so important to make sure your the words you choose are compelling and interesting. So yeah, it, it's funny how my background was so trained for academics, like academic papers. Mm-hmm. And it really took me a couple of years, legit, to unlearn some of those academic quote unquote standards and to actually write more like you speak yeah. and more more in, of an engaging way. So like you will never, for example, see from me a giant paragraph ever. <laughs> yeah, we learned. Yeah, I learned that a lot. Yeah. Uh, like I used years. to be like, oh, no, it needs to be at least three to four sentences or, you know, and that's the minimum. And now I'm like one sentence. If it's long, it's its own paragraph. Mm-hmm. Enter, enter. <laughs> And it's people. It's how people consume it, and I think a yeah. lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake with their newsletters as well. And I learned that a couple mm-hmm. of years ago from my coach. And it's just <laughs> white space. I love white space. Yes. I mean, it's like every like I like an eye for graphical design. And the first yeah. thing I look at for every design is it if it's too close to the edge. Yes, I'm, drives I'm, me crazy. I'm, I'm crazy. I'm like, <laughs> come on, like put that one inch imaginary like border around everything you do, mm-hmm. and it just it makes it easier for people to consume the content. So it's just all little stuff like that. And another quick tip that I love sharing with people is like, let's say you're writing a sentence and you're like, I love helping people with podcasting, speaking, traveling, and salsa dancing. Okay. There's four things in that sentence, which are all true. (laughs) But um, okay. How about you break that into, I love helping people with colon and then put those four things into bullets. Now Mm. it's even easier to read it scan it, process it faster. And I don't know, I, I'm just, I would much rather read a set of bullets than to read a giant blob of something. 
It's interesting because even with thinking, bringing it back to podcasting, I always think about the podcast description, right? iTunes yeah. doesn't do any formatting there. I know, it drives me crazy. <laughs> that, like, what guidance do you give? Pod- I mean, have you, I'm sure you've launched several shows. And so that's one of the things I think podcasters overlook. And we, we mm-hmm. spend time on that with clients as well to make sure like it's punchy and it, and it draws people in. So I'm wondering what, right. what tips you have for writing an effective uh, podcast description. Yeah, I think the number one thing, as with lots of stuff that we have to do for, you know, pod- as podcasters and entrepreneurs, is to think what does the person reading this care about? So your first default might be like, let me list my entire resume so people take me seriously and see me as an expert and actually want to listen to my show. Yeah. And I think there's some element of, okay, put some credibility factors in there, which is great. But if it's just all on and on about you, no one's going to read that. Like, they're like, good for you. I don't care. And they might get the sense, well, maybe the show is just the person bragging about themselves <laughs> the entire time. So they might just kind of write you off. Yeah. So I would say really, especially like in the first line, maybe the first line, don't make it about you. Make it about what the audience cares about. So, you know, open it up with like, do you want to apply psychology for more business success? Question mark, you know, like ask a question or mm. think about something that's relevant to your show that you could ask and it would really ping your ideal potential listeners being like, oh yes, that's me. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to keep reading. Yeah. That's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's one of the, it's copywriting 101, I would think mm-hmm. like g- grabbing their attention as yeah. quick as possible because there's so many yeah. distracting things in this world and people are probably scanning these descriptions. And so that, that's a great tip to just have that question because you want to see like, is this for me? You want to know really quick, is this for me? Mm-hmm. Um, and and if that if that first line is compelling, um, to your point, it's going to pull them in and say, well, yeah, that, that actually, yeah, that describes me. So I'm going to give you an extra 30 seconds to read through the description and then decide if I want to hit play that first episode or subscribe right. to the podcast. And it, it might seem obvious too, but I would really encourage people to copy their description and paste it over into something like grammarly.com, uh, which is, I think you can use it for free. I have the advanced version to help me catch little extra things that I might miss, but just copy and paste it over, even if it's just into like a word doc or something where it'll underline spelling errors or, or, you know, like an extra space in front of a comma by accident, because I can't tell you how many descriptions I've seen of places. And if someone's interviewing me on the show, my first thought is like, oh, I don't know if I want to go on this show because it's a little bit sloppy. I'll usually just take a screenshot and give them a bunch of edits because I'm like a nerd for that. And so I'm yeah. like, oh, you might want to change those things. Just FYI, <laughs> not being rude, <laughs> but just like trying to help. But I would say, or, you know, even have someone who's your buddy just to read it over, yeah. read it out loud. Does it still make sense to them? Because if you just think of it as an afterthought and just slap something up, if there are errors in there, you are going to lose people or people are just not going to take you as seriously, or maybe they're not going to want to interview you on their show or be on your show if it's like an influencer you're trying to get as a guest. So be mindful of that. It's a simple, easy step, but sometimes I think people skip it in just being hurried. Can you speak to the like the power of words to move people? I, mm. I think it's so like underestimated and you know, I've read books that have just blown me away. Um, you know, yeah. you know, p- poetry written correctly at the right time, even like a, a no, an email sometimes is, can bring people yeah. to tears. And and so I'm wondering, I imagine being just a student of that craft, if you've had that experience, so if you could talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately, it really just boils down to communication. And that can be in in video, in an audio, in written form, all of them. So the ability to compel you know, amazing s- stories through any different medium is what human nature is all about. I mean, from back in the caveman days, drawing animals and, and things on the wall, they were trying to communicate. They were trying to record mm-hmm. things and make them last longer. And I think that's what we humans just innately are our program to want to do. And so if you're more comfortable on a camera, do more video. If you're more comfortable with audio, do a podcast. If you're really comfortable with writing, do writing. Um, but definitely don't underestimate the power of writing to complement anything else that you're doing, especially with, at least with these days, SEO and, mm-hmm. and a lot of these 
you know, even iTunes is arguably a search engine. So yeah. there have been times when I was like, okay, let me figure out Pinterest ads. So I go onto iTunes and I type in Pinterest ads and I'll listen to every episode that has that keyword just to see, you know, like, and if I love the episode, then I'm more likely to subscribe and rate and review and all that with the host and, you know, maybe buy their stuff. So you really have to keep the the power of words in mind, both for search and for grabbing someone's attention and, and pulling them in deeper. Is there any content you've consumed lately, book, uh, even like a, a, a newsletter or just a blog post that that uh, that, that comes to mind that uh, oh, was memorable? And I'm really in a mode right now of no consuming yeah. anyone else's stuff and just doing yeah, because do I'm also like a lifetime learner and I'm a teacher by trade. Like I literally, oh, sorry, my dog needs to go jump off my lap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he was, I was trying to hold him back from jumping cause I knew he was going to make noise, but oh well. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It, so this is what we do. Like I yeah. heard my, my dog bark, <laughs> heard, like fire engines go by, but it's what, why I love leaving it in is because it's yeah. podcasters talking to podcasters. We, we talked about what we're holding our mic on right now. Like yes. mine is on like an apples, apples box and stuff. So it, this is like literally like the real hashtag like real talk <laughs> i know he jumped up on my lap before we started and i was like i don't think he's gonna last here the whole time yeah. so i was like i maybe should kick him off but he was so cute i was like okay i'll stay so he gets a he, shout out so what, what's his name and what type his of name is tuck okay. and he has his own hashtag on instagram he does not have his own ca- account because his mother is too busy okay? yeah. but if you search the hashtag chill as tuck Okay. Oh, wow. That's a great one. <laughs> yeah, because he's super chill. Like, he never barks, ever. Uh, he's like a 10-pound Minpin Chihuahua mix. Okay. Really sweet. So, the listener, yeah, you just so what was I new, saying? some new homework now on that. I so, know, right? <laughs> hashtag kill is tuck. Oh, yeah. And right before Tuck Jeff off my lap, I was saying, I haven't been consuming as much because I've been really trying to do and, like, be interviewed on more shows and do more interviews and just, like, really go all in because I think that sometimes we get too wrapped up in the shiny object syndrome or what is everyone else doing? Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is true for writing. So if you feel like you're not strong with your copy, then what you said, Harry, is incredible advice is go read the writing of other people you do find compelling. Yeah. Because the more you read, the more you write like that. And I have Mm -hmm. another funny story from childhood. I, I can't remember what grade it was, maybe fourth grade. And the teacher came by and she was like, you misspelled that word. And I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> and the word was color. And she said, there's no you in color. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, there is. In all the books I'm reading, it says C-O-L-O-U-R. Yeah. And she's like, oh, that's the British spelling. We don't put a U in it in the US. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't even realize because I was reading all these, whatever the heck I was reading. I don't that's remember. Funny. But yeah. So what we read, we also then tend to write like that. Yeah. With style and spelling and everything. So read things that are compelling to you and you're naturally going to start writing that way. Mm-hmm. And then the next step, like you said, is to actually rewrite them, just copy them word for word. And that's not what you yeah. send out to your, you know, your audience, but just the act of writing psychologically is going to, you know, embed it better. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a deeper level of processing. Yeah. You were going to work that muscle. Yeah. And then at a certain point though, you need to pull pull the plug Mm -hmm. and stop looking at what everyone else is doing and just freaking do it. Like you're never going to get your own good writing style. You are never going to learn what actually works for your audience and your voice until you do it. So there is no, I mean, someone might want to tell you that there is to sell you something, but there is no one way to write good copy. There's Mm -hmm. no one right way to do a podcast. There's no one right way to do a video. You have to find your own rhythm and get feedback from your audience. And even if that audience is super small, that's fine. You just start and keep on going, 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 going. So at a certain point, you know, get off the the drug of shiny object syndrome and just do stuff. And that's the way you're going to actually figure out what works for you. My coach likes to differentiate between just in time learning versus just in case. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. As a teacher that like ping, ping, ping. Yes. It's amazing. So if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's like our entire school system is basically like just in case learning. So yeah. you're going to take a chemistry class and you're going to learn all about this chemical stuff just in case you might need it sometime or whatever. Versus just in time learning might be saying, okay, let's take an entrepreneurship class and we're not going to teach you anything about building a website until you're actually building the website. Okay, mm-hmm. step one. 
Let's get a host. What is that? Let me teach you. Let's pick up domain. What is that? Let me teach you. So you're never learning something until you actually need it and you actually will apply it. Yeah. I think that's incredible because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, podcast folks will go take all the courses and then make no progress. So like, yeah. don't take 10 courses, just take one and actually implement it. You're not allowed to buy any other one until you actually implement that one. <laughs> What's interesting is if you think psychologically, and I've, I've put myself in those shoes, it's it's easier to like consume content sometimes than to actually do the work. <laughs> oh, for sure. It's so much easier. Yeah. Like if someone wanted to pay me just to take courses and watch webinars, like uh, sign me up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> So coming from an academic background, can you can you think of a couple of uh, mentors who have been like instrumental for you as as you've been like growing your business um, mm. and getting to where you are now? Yeah, that's so good. It's so funny. People have asked me about mentors for a long time, and I've never really been able to give super good answers. But I can tell you about just a couple of people's books that I've read or podcasts I've listened to that I feel mm -hmm. like have been life-changing or or really directional for me. So the first one is Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. That's the number one book that's changed my life the most out of anything I've ever read. Uh, I read it at 21. I just came back from studying abroad in Germany for a year. So my life was already like opening up way bigger because I grew up in California and I was like, this is the only place I ever want to live. And then I lived in Germany. I was like, oh my God, I want to travel everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and so... And I was also questioning academia by that point because I was like, whoa, there's more to life than just getting my PhD and like yeah. working up the ladder. So I read that book right when I got back from that. So it was kind of this just completely pivotal time anyway. And that made me want to be an entrepreneur. It took me, I didn't fully quit. I didn't actually start a business that worked until I was 30. So it took me nine years to figure yeah. it out and, and all that. But hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that. And uh, so that was that one. And then I remember reading Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. I, I got, came across that in 2008 or 2009. So pretty, pretty soon after it came out. And I could not believe that someone had put into words that had stuff that had been bouncing on my head, not even fully formulated because he's all about travel and like yeah. interesting things. Like he opens up the book with talking about performing for like a uh, tango dancing in Argentina. And I, I'm a salsa dancer. I learned salsa when I lived in Germany randomly. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, like that, that book I call is like my Bible. Yeah. Not like I'm actually implementing it very well. Cause I, for a, lot of us, <laughs> for a lot of us, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say those two books are the ones I recommend the absolute most. Uh, in terms of podcasts, I'm really obsessed with Gary Vaynerchuk. That's yeah. the number one show I listen to. I listen to it probably every day, I would say. Uh, I, I also, this one's not as much for business, but I listen to Erica Mandy's The Newsworthy yeah, every day. I love Erica. I was just chatting with her uh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. oh that's you. amazing. She's yeah. Cool. So it's like the, all the day's news in 10 minutes or less, fast, fair, fun, and on the go. <laughs> and, she loves uh, that we know that and that you know, know. Her, her clap, <laughs> whatever, they, like the clap of like her show. So yeah. we're going to. Like, listen, you ready? Listen. Let's do this. <laughs> so it's something to be said about like talk yes. about a snappy copy. Like that's yes. memorable, you know, and people repeat it and, and they love it. And that's oh, no. just stuff right I need there. to do a better job. I've got a closing line that I've pretty much yeah. said almost every episode. So that, that's good. I've got to start, but she's a good uh, example of doing it even better. So yeah, I listen to hers every th first thing in the morning, just like get the day's news and just kind of like a fun way to to start the day is like make coffee or whatever. Yeah. And then I love Gary's stuff because it just keeps reminding me to put my head down and work. And uh, this is the most incredible time that we've ever been alive. I really believe that. I mean, there's horrible crap going on. That's mm -hmm. undeniable, but I would never want to be alive at any other time than right now. I feel very lucky for that. So um, it's just like, take advantage and let's go. <laughs> So those are my three, I'd say. Yeah, it's so funny because he's very polarizing, Gary Vaynerchuk, for those of you, a few people that don't know who Gary V is. And it's it, exactly what you said. It's almost that kick in the butt. It's that mm -hmm. it's that espresso shot, that <laughs> entrepreneurial espresso shot every morning. Because it's at the point now where like 70 or 80 or maybe even 90% of what he says is like the same stuff. Yeah. But it's fascinating. Every time I hear him, I love his keynotes because he gets in front of these audiences. Yes. And he just yeah. he just reads people the riot act. He's like, look. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Like you want, the, you want me to give you the easy solution. There isn't one. And he yeah. just tells his story 
And he does it in a way that what I love from a podcasting perspective is that you know, yours almost like love him or hate him at this point. <laughs> I don't know why anyone would hate him. Like, I don't, I honestly don't even get why he's polarizing. Like if you actually listen, let's say more than one or two things, yeah. you would see like his advice is really practical. And like, cause then people will, sometimes people will be like, oh, well he never sleeps. And he says, yeah. don't sleep. And I'm like, okay, that's not true. You might be <laughs> hear like two lines out of context. He doesn't say that at all. But what I what I love about him too, and like what you're saying in reading the riot act, just like calling it like it is, is I feel like until I discovered him, there weren't that many, I would say, good role models in business, mm. at least that I came across. Because it seems like there's all these people who are like, I've got a big jet. You want to be rich? Like dollar dollar bills, y'all. Like I get bling for my wife because that's what she deserves. And all women want money. That's what, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. like join my course. I'm like, I wanted to barf all over myself. Yeah. And just people too, like make seven figures in seven days, download my worksheet and pay me yeah. $200 and it can be yours too. It's like absolute scam. And so what I love about his is just like, it takes work. Be patient. Put in the effort. Just because you started an Instagram or started a podcast yesterday doesn't mean you're going to be like an influencer getting paid 10 grand for shout outs. Like, right. come on. <laughs> I, I definitely want to go down a couple of the rabbit holes, but I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to wrap sure. up with a couple of questions. Sure. Um, what's something you've changed your mind about recently? Hmm. I guess just really this year in 2018, I changed my mind about speaking on stage being scary. Mm. And I, I consciously made the effort to also apply psychology. Of how can I reframe this and make it not something scary? And literally, if you would have told me two years ago, five years ago, any years ago, that I would actually be looking forward to speaking the next time, I would have called you a liar. <laughs> and so for me, my big writing has never been really hard. For me, writing the book wasn't scary. So in working with clients now, I just try to channel my fear of public speaking because I definitely remember that into this is what they're feeling by putting themselves out there mm. in the book form or people just starting a podcast. I know I was actually nervous to start a podcast too. It wasn't as bad as speaking on stage because I could still do it in the comfort and like safety of my own house. But uh, yeah, I think changing my mind about what I'm capable of in terms of speaking on stage live in front of people has been a big part of my journey this year. What's uh, the most misunderstood thing about you? I don't think there's really anything. I don't know. I mean, if people get to know me, then they usually say I'm like funny and down to earth. And I, I can, I think often be the life of a party, Yeah. but I still try to be tuned in and respectful. So if like people aren't jiving with it, then I'll just like tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's most people aren't conscious of that. Like they're just like, this is me, extrovert, and then right. like expect everyone else to like jump in, and they're like, right. like what ha what's up with Red Bull Girl? <laughs> yeah, so I think maybe that could be the answer. Then is like if someone just meets me and I'm really on, and it's like a real big event, and I'm like making the jokes, so they might think like that's the only box that I could fit into. When yeah. when really that's not true. <laughs> so t uh, talk a little bit about the books that you currently have, or anything that you have in the works as well. Yeah. So the two books I've written, the first one is copywriting for podcasters. So very niche, really only people who have a show or want to start a show would care about that. And then I have a second book called Permission to Write a Brand Building Book. Mm -hmm. And I also wrote it with podcasters in mind. It's in the subtitle. And it's all about breaking, busting those myths that are holding you back from becoming an author, claiming the title of the Amazon bestseller, which is way easier than you might have thought, but still worthwhile, in my opinion. And I, I describe that in the book. And just kind of let's break down some of that imposter syndrome that is being held around books. Because that's what I found really in working with a lot of clients is, yes, I'm imparting valuable information and tried and true tactics around the actual self-publishing. But what so many people really are needing from me is that reassurance. Yes, you're good enough to write a book. Yes, mm -hmm. your idea is valid. Yes, your story should be told. And uh, just kind of getting that feedback from someone who's done it has been really valuable. So I was like, I want to put this in a book form too, so people can get it in that way. Well, obviously I have links to those in the show notes. Those sound like amazing books. And uh, what, what do you think that, what do you see as a time frame for people from like idea to inception or idea to publication yeah. of a book? 
Yeah. So I did both of my books in 30 days because I'm crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> results will vary. <laughs> yeah. I have, I do have a number of people who have done it along with me, but I, inside of my group program, which is called the Bestsellerator, uh, I have a, in a detailed day by day and week by week checklist to do it in eight weeks. So you can wow. literally go from no idea to bestseller on Amazon in eight weeks. But what I love about that too is if you're like, whoa, okay, eight weeks still sounds too crazy. You could take, okay, what I say to do in week one, you take two weeks to do that. So just double it. And now you do it in 16 weeks. And maybe four months is a lot better time frame for fitting into your schedule and stuff. So it can be adjusted according to your comfort level. So <laughs> everything's customizable. Make sure you send me a link to that as well. We'll put that in the show notes too. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for showing up. I'm really happy we got to connect again. We haven't seen each other since Australia. So I'm, I'm honored that like we're better friends now and we're going to keep yeah. in better touch and we're going to see each other at the various podcasting conferences and continue uh, to grow our friendship. So thanks for taking the time to show up. My pleasure. Thank you so much. What's the best place for folks to track you down online? Yeah, good question. So I would say let's start with my free Facebook group. So okay. If you've really loved what we've talked about with books, especially if you go to copy that pops.com forward slash Facebook, that's a short little URL that will redirect you over to my free Facebook group. And that is really other people who are writing, launching, trying to hit bestseller and using their book to get more media attention, more exposure for their podcast brand and business and bring more money into their pockets too. So that'd be a great place to come and say hello and join us. <laughs> okay. Copy that pops.com forward slash Facebook. Yes. All right. Thanks, Laura. Have a thanks, fantastic, Mary. fantastic week. You too. So thanks to Laura again for coming on the show. Nice to have that time uh, spending it together with her and a bunch of other great podcasters in Australia. And then for her to come on the show and share some of her amazing knowledge. I, I really realized, uh, I really realized <laughs> um, when the we were talking about what she does. And I saw her presentation. She this is an amazing copywriter and I knew it'd be helpful for this audience. So I'm glad we were finally able to make that happen. Again, full show notes at podcastjunkies.com 187 intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite and the fa fantastic Scarlett 2i2, which I use on a weekly basis to record my episodes. Tune in next week for my conversation with Greg Clunas, host of Tiny Leaps and Big Changes. And if you made it this far, you're no doubt waiting for the retention hashtag. Um, if you were listening to the episode, you already know what it's going to be. It's going to be chill as Tuck. Tuck is uh, Laura's dog who happened to make a cameo in the episode. And he has got his own Instagram hashtag and it's chill as Tuck. So we can use it on Twitter this week. And, and you can tag uh, myself, podcast underscore junkies, and uh, Laura at at Laptop Laura. Laptop Laura, one word. Thanks for all you do to support the show. I'll talk to you next week.